Hi, this is Zivi Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And speaking of books, I have two of my own books coming out this spring and summer. Princess Charming is a picture book, which debuts on April 19th, and Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature comes out on July 1st, and it is truly a labor of love. I hope you'll pre-order, order, order, and join me on tour as I go across the country. You can find out more at zibbyowens.com or bookendsmemoir.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at zibbyowens because I always post about everything. Enjoy the show. Georgina Cross is the author of Nanny Needed, a novel. The author of The Stepdaughter, The Missing Woman, and Nanny Needed, Georgina worked as a journalist and then spent nine years in business development for an aerospace and defense contractor before joining the Huntsville-Madison County Chamber of Commerce as the workforce director. She lives in Alabama with her husband and four sons. Welcome, Georgina. Thanks for coming on Moms Now. Time to read books to discuss Nanny Needed. Thank you for having me. This is just, again, I said it earlier, it's really cool to actually see you face to face and talk to you. So thank you for having me. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Yes. Okay. Nanny Needed. As I was just joking, I was like, is this my building on the cover? But it's <laughs> this book about a New York family and a, the girl who goes to work for the family on the Upper West Side, though. I have to say I'm on the Upper East Side. You were just explaining that while you live in Alabama, your sister had lived here for years. So go back for the whole where this book came from and yep. and all of that. Okay. I would love to know if there is a situation in your building where there is a nanny that has gotten up to the, you know, with the family and the antics. Cause I was at a book club meeting and this woman was insistent. She said, tell me who this is based on. And I was like, I I don't, I mean, I I came up with it in my head and it was inspired by other stuff I read about, but I don't know of a family that this has really happened to. And if you know of a family, please tell me, but she was unconvinced. She really feels like there is someone out there. And I'm it's like, no, I made it up. Uh, but the chance there could be a chance that there's a family out there. But yeah, my sister, she lived not. in New York City. I, d- I don't know them. They're not friends with me. I'll tell you that. Much. <laughs> okay. So my sister was in the East Village for, gosh, 15 years, maybe. And so because we had a free place to stay, we would fly to New York and, and sleep in her apartment. She had a two bedroom with a hallway. You know, that was a really big deal to have an apartment with a hallway because she used to be like in a tenement type of apartment. And we'd walk and my parents would come visit and, you know, you got, you're in New York city. It's, it's so great to walk. And so we would explore and end up in the upper East side, upper West side. And just from standing on the sidewalks and looking up at the penthouse buildings, that's really where the story percolated from. I thought, wouldn't that be so fascinating to know what's going on behind those, you know, drapes in the windows and, and these penthouses where you imagine everything is wonderful. And you imagine that with money, they can figure out everything and they can be happy, but what if they're not? And so that was the germ of the idea. And then it was, okay, who can infiltrate a family like this? And um, I had tossed around some ideas and just landed on a nanny. And I know there are lots of nanny books and we've been trying to tell people it's not this is not your typical nanny book. Like she does not sleep with the, the husband. It's not one of, you know, we don't go down that trope. This is unlike most nanny books. And I think that's why people are enjoying it. Yes, it's it's fantastic. And I feel like if it's if there are any comps, I don't know if you read The Photographer by Mary Dixie Carter. No, um, I haven't, but I love I like it. Sounds somewhat intriguing. similar in that and then there the other one I would say, not that you're looking for comps, is a Laura Laura Hankins I'm Happy and You Know It. Okay. So those are like in, but not you know, versus infidelity. These are not infidelity type books, right? It's just someone who's infiltrated and someone who's infiltrated. Yeah. I love the idea of a photographer. That's, I had not considered that, you know, Tudor was, I'd read a short story about a Tudor who, who was, you know, obviously they go into these households and they get to know the families to a certain extent, but a nanny, I just thought would be really interesting. And, and it's hard to market this book because there's such a twist four or five chapters in and it's not meant to floor people. I think a lot of people assume that it was it's coming, but it's a way to propel the rest of the story. And then you get to the end where it's like everything kind of implodes. And th- I had a lot of fun with this book. It's different from my other two. The other two are vo- more domestic suspense. This was my ability with Penguin Random House. They were like, just go creatively and the stranger, the better. And, and I, I enjoyed that. It was It was fun. 
I love it. Well, as someone who is literally sitting inside one of those buildings right now, I'm like on the other side of the curtain, you know, like looking out at like to look peering down on you on the sidewalk, like waving, you know, and here I am. So I will say life is the same. Life is life. No matter where you are, life is right. full of love and illness and heartbreak and loss and happiness. And it doesn't matter if you're on the top floor or the basement. Right. You know, And that's exactly what it is. It's, it, you know, for so many of us that walk the streets of New York and to stand on that sidewalk and you just assume, right. And like you said, every family has its own challenges, no matter what. It's just, I think it's fun to imagine that there could be so much going on behind those closed curtains that we're not aware of, especially when it's in a situation like this family and what this world they've been able to get away with creating because they are cut off in this penthouse floor and, and nobody has to necessarily see them or know what they're getting up to. And money did allow them to a certain extent to hide some things, right? So this is how I feel about LA and like Bel Air or all these neighborhoods with these giant you know, hedges. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what happens there? What is that right. like behind the gate? So yeah, I feel the same way. In New York, I don't feel the same because I'm like, oh, I've been to all these buildings. But Right. And, and, like, and these are some mean, of my neighbors. I didn't mean to suggest that, you know, obviously I'm very lucky and fortunate, privileged to be in this position and it's not the same. But I, I just meant like from an emotional standpoint. It doesn't matter where you live. You have Mm -hmm. the same stuff. But anyway, okay, off topic. Back to the book. The interesting thing about this nanny is this nanny, I would not hire this nanny. This nanny had no experience at all being a nanny. And I'm like, how did she even scoop this thing up? But yet, you know, when the ad somehow magically appears in her building and she's like, oh, I can do it. Like I, you know, I've been around kids and whatever. I don't know. I have a lot higher criteria. (laughs) Well, because you actually, you know, there are like four, you have four kids, correct? I do, I do. Right. And see, we have a combined family of four sons, but they're, the older two are, one's out of college, right? We're we're way past beyond nanny stage. And so, but it's still, it's like a, a, a ruckusy household. And so you're right. I mean, this, this, this girl, this one woman had no, no real reason that she should have even thought she could apply for this job, except for the desperation. If she needed extra cash, right. this was going to pay more than waiting tables. And then as we find out, there's like a, a more sinister reason why she even saw the ad in the first place, why she was picked in the first place, and why her nannying lack of skills really ended up not meaning anything. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, wait, go back a minute. And first of all, how can you have a child who's already in college? You look like so... Young. No, that's my... Hu- so my husband and I are... Oh, well, thank you. But it's because I'm wearing makeup today. No, my, it's not. Uh, <laughs> There's no way that you're old enough to have a child in college. There's just no I way. I know. My, my husband is 10 years older and his... So he's got one out of college, one in college. But we I've known them since they were middle school, freshman year. We've been together. We used to work together. And then my kids are 16 and 13. So... My husband jokes that he was like an empty nester for one week. No, 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 not even a week, a day. And then, and then we got married and he was like, I'm starting all over again with two teenagers in the house and curfews. And what did I, what have I done? I'm like, well, you wanted to get married. (laughs) Yeah. My husband doesn't have his own kids, but married, I have four kids. And so now he's like, or in the teenage years. It's like, it's like chaos. It's just crazy. Teenage years are rough. It's like a whole other web of, of, it just gets harder, right? It's like the toddler twos and then just gets harder and harder. And now we're like into legal ramifications. If they do something wrong, that's, <laughs> that's my fear. I'm like, whatever you do, you've just now jumped it up a level of, of accountability and like grounding isn't going to cut it at this age. Right. And so, yeah, have fun with that. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, go back again. Sorry, I'm all over the place. So you grew let me have your life story really quickly. You, you, you're from New Orleans. Then mm-hmm. what happened? Then what happened? Yeah, I mean, from New Orleans to Huntsville is probably the most boring part. <laughs> Before New Orleans, so I was born in Hong Kong. My dad's um, an English sea captain, ship captain. So he met my mother in Hong Kong, but she's Malaysian Chinese. And they lived together and then they moved around. We lived in Dubai. We've lived all over. We lived on a ship with my family because we just were never around my dad. We didn't speak English. And my mom was really concerned about that. We went through a typhoon, saved some Vietnamese refugees that their boat was sinking. So that was like, I've always thought about writing about that as well. I started it and I'm like, I don't know emotionally if I'm there yet. I don't remember, obviously it's from my parents telling the story. We were so little, but then we ended up in New Orleans, huge shipping port of the world. And so my dad ran a company there and 
that's how we ended up in America. But yeah, I, I got a job in TV news and I was in New Orleans and then came to Huntsville. So that jump has actually been like the most normal bit. <laughs> and then we've just been here ever since working and raising the kids. So yeah, that's, that's our lives in a nutshell. And where are your parents now? <laughs> They're here. So after Hurricane Katrina, they had trees on the house. That's another fun story too. My dad got picked up by a Walmart truck driver because he was stranded on the side of the interstate. We didn't hear from him for five days because all the cell towers had been taken down. So that was really fun. And he ended up in the newspaper because of his plight. But they live here now because at least they can be closer to my kids and they were ready to retire. And then my sister is now in Chicago with her kids. So yeah, it's it's fun. Huntsville's at least calm. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. That's crazy. You're like the Forrest Gump of like, you know, I mean, look at you like all through. That's crazy. That's yeah. So then when did you start writing? Since I was a kid, but you know, it was always a hobby. And and what you hear, I'm sure from so many authors you've interviewed where they didn't know necessarily if they could cut it as an author. It's very different to write on the side and maybe, you know, and I did the typical stuff, the TV, uh, the high school newspaper, the t- the college newspaper. I did all of that, intern at a TV station, but just thought I'll get a degree in broadcast journalism because at least that's a paycheck and put it on the back burner really for writing, but always wanted to get back into it. And the kids you know, they, uh, they take up a lot of time. <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't until, um, to answer your question, it really wasn't until about six years ago that I sat down and thought, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going, I've worked in a corporate world for 20 plus years, it's time. And so I, I would work my day job Monday through Friday, right on the weekends. Um, slowly but surely wait, wrote a couple wait, of books. Wait, what was your day job during the week? Was it still in broadcast journalism? No, no. At the time, it was airspace. It was basically airspace and defense contracting. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, which is a far cry from the creative world, but it, it paid better, right, than a lot of jobs. And that's how I met my husband. He's still in that world. Hustle's a very DOD kind of town. Um, NASA's here and and a lot of military here. But yeah, I, and I just thought, well, I'll write on the weekends. The kids were getting older. And so I put some drafts together and found my agent at a Chicago writing conference. We pitched, I pitched to her face to face and she signed me. But it took another four years. I mean, it, this this is a long haul. It took another four years before she finally sold the book. And when she did, it was a two book deal. And I had been writing Nanny Needed in the background. They always tell you like, don't sit idle and wait while you're in submission, keep writing. And because I love it so much, I was like, no problem. I'll write on the weekends. And I came up with Nanny Needed and my agent was like, oh my God. And she sold it within a month to Penguin Random House. So I ended up I'm still signed to two publishers. So last year it was four books because then I was hired to ghostwrite for someone, a local celebrity in town. And I've got three more books. So I'm I'm kind of tired. (laughs) Whoa. So you have, so the other two obviously came out. Then Nanny Needed's coming, just came out. Then you have four ghostwriting projects. No. Uh, no, just the one ghostwriting, thank goodness, just the one. But no, in the first year that I signed my my contracts, I had to come out with four books total because there was oh, the two-book deal, it. then all the edits and slash and burns oh, to get my managed. Gosh. And then I ghostwrote the book for this lady and uh, turned it in. And then this year, yeah, I should have had a book come out this month. But I, last year, kinda, I hit a wall, <laughs> as so many of us did, especially for the summer when we realized COVID wasn't, really lifting, right? I think mentally that took a toll on so many of us of now we're just living with COVID. We're not waiting for it to go away. We're just living with it. And um, so I pushed my deadlines and my next book doesn't come out till September. You're, you're a slacker. You're a total slacker. What are you doing? <laughs> there are days where I'm like, what? But I mean, I, mean, I just, I, I'm proud of myself for, you know, the, I, the word I learned last year was you can, it's okay to say no. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so I'm starting to say no. And what is that book about? That one is about two sisters who are estranged. And one of them ends up dying in a house fire, but her teenage daughter survives. She breaks out of the home and is free. And then come to find out that the will that was updated a year prior, so that if anything were to happen to her, that her daughter would go and live with the estranged sister. So of course the sister's like, that's peculiar and the girl, the change girl comes and lives with her. And then we find out exactly why the family was estranged and all these wonderful secrets. So that's with, 
that's the next book with Book of Tour. I'm with um, Hachette Publishing for those contracts. And then the next Penguin Random House book I'm finishing right now. Well, the edits. I'm finishing edits now. And that one's set on the Oregon coast. A few years back, my husband rented a house and all the family got in there. And it was like overlooking the Pacific. It was beautiful. And everybody's like playing Scrabble and baking. And I'm over there going, this would be a great place for like murder and mayhem. And a storm has to come in. And so that's that's that book. I'm excited about that one. It's like the cover. I'm already so excited about the cover. Wow. You are just doing it. Look at you. There's so many books. You're just cranking them out. This is amazing. But dueling, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. contracts and like yeah. two houses. And this is awesome. Yeah. You're living the life. Well, and I would not thank you, but I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> I do not recommend signing two contracts, right? It was very exciting at the time. But it is a lot. And you'd hear of authors where they, you know, one book a year is a lot. Yeah. And then the really big authors, they take like five years to to create this this beautiful piece. And so to pump out at this velocity is a little overkill. And I really started to feel that last year. So moving forward, we're going to slow down a bit and take some time. My kid, my my 16 year old, he's going to be a senior next year in high school. And I really don't want to spend his senior year in my writing cave, like I did the last two years. So before he leaves us, I kind of want to see him a few times. (laughs) Wait, so describe the writing cave. So the writing cave, I've actually posted photos. So if you ever want to peruse my Instagram, I'll probably, I'm going to do some lives from the writing bunker is what we call it. It's our house isn't from the 1970s. It's five levels. And if you go, they're all split levels. So if you go down several staircases, there's a services room and it's filled with like the plumbing, the pipes, the circuit break, all this stuff. And if you go under the pipes, there's this back part that we jokingly refer to as the prison cellar. Like that's where we would, if we were to ever kidnap anyone, we would shove them down there and nobody would ever hear them. And it's brick wall and my desk. Just I'm not ha- sure I feel comfortable ever coming to your house. Not that I'm invited, <laughs> but when you already know where you're going to store the kidnap victim. I don't know. Yeah. It's great. And people are, well, it's originally was built as a tornado shelter. We're friends with the family who built this house. And they're like, in the seventies, this huge tornado came through and that's where we hid. And I'm like, well, it happens that the dimensions are just perfect for my writing desk. And so I go down there and I'm shut away from the children. I can hear the pipe, the pipes turn on. I'm like, okay, that one's getting ready for school. That one's going to work. Okay, that one still needs to get ready. But if they pound up and down the stairs, sometimes I can hear them. The only worry is my, you know, my sister's like, can you please make sure you get outside and get some sunshine sometimes and get some oxygen? <laughs> wow. I did peruse your Instagram and I see that you you also have a show. What is it? Writing with G or Live with G? Or Books with G. Books with yeah. G. Sorry. Books yeah. with G, which you had to stop for Kevin Hart. You're like, what, a huge Kevin Hart fan? I'm like, what is going on? She has like 10 posts about Kevin Hart. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, it's so funny. It's, it's My whole Instagram is like, books writing. And then there's Kevin Hart. Yeah. Yeah. He came to town and it was, if you've never seen him, Zibby, he is hysterical. I mean, he's hysterical no matter what, but this show that he's on tour with and they don't let you bring in your phones. So they lock them up in these little cases. And it, all of a sudden everybody's like, what time is it? Like nobody has watches anymore. So nobody knew what time right. to go into the show. And so, because I didn't have a phone, I couldn't go live. And I was like, oh no. And, but yeah, so that's my, my show in quotes. It's my attempt to try to do some lives, some marketing, honestly, a chance to just talk to people, mm-hmm. you know, writing is such a solitary endeavor. I'm alone a lot in my head for 70 hours a day. And so just the ability to, to talk Instagram live. I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> Kevin Hart just needs to stop coming to town so I can actually do another show. Well, now I want to go figure out like where he is on tour and he's, he's, oh, he's going like the tours for the next few months. It's, it's, we were laughing so hard. We're I'm writing fine. this down. The last comedian I saw was Seinfeld, but you know, that's such a New Yorky thing to do. Like here I am well, going to the Upper West Side. To Kevin to Hart, we were laughing so hard. We were crying. I took the teenage children, so it's not appropriate. Do not bring your little ones. I think okay. you have younger ones. I do. Yeah. I do. I won't go bring the little ones. Go with your girlfriends. Go with the husband. You'll laugh okay. until you're crying. Okay. Don't even wear makeup. It's like not even worth it. It just all comes off. 
I have this new, someone sent me this mascara from Thrive Cosmeceuticals and it like doesn't come off. It's the coolest thing. So now I can wear it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know. It's not like waterproof. I don't know what it is, (laughs) but my makeup remover doesn't take it off. And then I put it on and it stays like nothing ever happens. It used to smudge. I I don't know. I feel like I need. need. Yeah. It's it's from Thrive. Thrive Cosmeceuticals. Uh, Yeah. I've heard of them. I see their stuff on Instagram. I'll have to do that because my mascara just runs constantly. I have an event this Sunday and it'll just be, and Kevin Hart, I mean, everybody was just sobbing from laughing and there's just makeup all over. We should just put them in touch. They should sell it in the, uh, (laughs) (laughs) I really should. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So from Alabama, right? You're in your bunker. This is such a visual. I just love like thinking of you doing this <laughs> underground writing, cranking out this content that now the rest of the world is you, you know, inhaling. And now here I am in New York reading about this New York moment while you're still there. It's just crazy. So I know. how do you how, aside from the Instagram lives, how do you sort of stay in the like do you travel? Do you like how do you stay in touch with everybody mm-hmm. all over the place? And because you're so you don't seem disconnected at all. You're like totally in it, right? You're mm-hmm. like, so I don't know. I, you know, and all three of my books came out during COVID. I have no, I have no concept of what it is to launch a book when it's not COVID. And I finally had a book party. Penguin Random House is a lot more cautious, right? Than some other publishers. So they really were not, you know, up until last summer, they were like, it's touch and go. If, if you can have your event. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so then finally October with the vaccines rolling out, we were like, we're good to go. But I should, I made sure I had an outdoor event at a brewery. So there was an indoor, but it was, there was enough space between everyone and but I was able to celebrate all three books. So I had a cake for each book. Aww. And that was exciting, you know, because I was like, this is for Nanny Nita, but I didn't want to forget about my first two. And so we were able to celebrate all three. And, um, but honestly, because I haven't been able to go anywhere, it's stuff like this. Like, thank goodness we have lives and interviews and Zoom interviews and YouTube stuff. And I've been, you know, nervous about these last year. I've gotten over that. And it's been so much better, I think, than traveling, honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hear about authors who it's such an expense and then maybe five people show up. You pop on a Zoom or or an Instagram Live and there's like hundreds and they're from all over and they're all sitting in their pajamas. (laughs) Yeah. Totally comfortable listening to you and they didn't have to go anywhere. So it's been, it's been helpful. I mean, honestly, I think in a weird way, we authors, people adapt, you know, we're really good at adapting and authors have been able to adapt. And I think readers are enjoying this like surplus of interviews. I think they're loving that they can sit on the couch and join a zoom that's taking place in LA or New York or Miami and they don't have to go anywhere. So that's been cool. And just the Facebook groups, there's so many that I have found in the last few years. That's been monumental. We all cheer each other on. So, you know, in each group, you get a hundred fans, like, wow. and then we're in turn fans of their work and promote their books. So yeah, I, you know, social media, it's like, it gets a lot of flack and I, I don't want to say that I'm on it all day long, but I definitely benefit and have been benefiting from how it's been able to, to get my books out there without me even, you know, really having to, to spend any money on advertising. I haven't spent a dime. The publicity teams may have and the marketing teams. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, well, you know, like with your show, was did this come out of COVID or was this, were you already doing your podcasts and your interviews prior? I was doing it prior. I started okay. in March, April of 2018. So I just started doing a lot more during COVID. Yeah. And now I have yeah. to ratchet back. I was literally just emailing, like being like, I can't keep, like if the world opens up now, like I have to go out and like be able to leave my desk. Like I yeah. can't, I can't maintain this pace anymore. Yeah. If, if yeah, well the in, the intro to your podcast alone, when you're like, and I have this show, and then I have this other show, and then I've got the publishing company, and then I've got you know the the chat. What is it? Twenty? No, what's your challenge? <laughs> I know I should stop. Twenty two and twenty two. Yes, twenty two and twenty. You know, just listen to you. Go back and listen to the intro of your podcast alone. <laughs> you'll be like, huh. <laughs> And then I read your article, was it a few months ago, where you were like, try, like burning out, I think. Yes, so I related yes. to that big time. And I think that's what ends up happening is 
you know, there, there will be a day of reckoning where you'll have to sit down and go, I love it all, but I'm going to have to cut two things. I think I had that day yesterday, honestly. Okay. I literally, not that the, I don't know why we're talking about this, but yeah, I like literally spent an hour and a half just typing out all the things that I do. And I'm like, because my whole thing is like, well, this doesn't take that much time. Well, this, I can tell this one, this one thing doesn't take that much. But then when you do like 20 things that don't take that much yeah. time, they take a lot of right. time. But right. I love and all I think, the stuff that I do, I love it. So it's really- But cool. I think, you know, because like per your point with COVID, you increased all your interviews because we were home. So we thought, exactly. well, yes. why not? A, to connect yep. with people because we weren't able to even see them. Yep. B, you had a sort of more idle time, sort of, you know, kids are still all over the place, yeah. but we crammed it, didn't yep. we? Like yep. A-type personalities will just cram yes. it into the schedule. And now you're right. Like as stuff opens up and there's now invitations and events, yep and distractions. Yep. Yeah. You're really going to have to sit down. I don't know what two you're going to cut. That's going to be painful for you, but maybe not, maybe not cut, just cut back or something. I don't know. Right. Or hire, you, you may need to hire someone. I have a great team. I have some oh, good. people who I work with. I love my team. They're awesome. And I just hired a COO of my whole business. And now I feel like she's going to help me figure everything out. So good. So she can be the managing of it all. She's going to manage everything. She's like, you should do this. You shouldn't do this. Like, how can we do this? I'm like, thank you. Yes. You tell me. Yes. (laughs) Yes. That, yeah. Let you do the fun bits. Yeah. I want to right. Be this, the talking head fun bit and the, the name and the face, and then let her like pull all the strings in the background, just tell you when to show up and when the next zoom is. (laughs) So do you like to read? You must love to read. What, what do you Every like? Every night. What yeah. Do you, I, what are some because areas? right now, because with my contracts and I'm, my head is in, you know, I write seven days a week. My husband was like, you know, once you start working from home, cause I was able to come, um, to leave my other job and, and come home two years ago. So I've been writing full time ever since. And he was like, I thought you'd at least take Sundays off. And I thought so too. And then I was like, no, I know myself better. I'm a workaholic and I might as well. I mean, if kids are sleeping and you know how it is, the older they yeah. get, they'll sleep till noon. So I'm like, well, I might as well get up in the morning. But yeah, I just, I enjoy it so much. So I just want to keep doing it. But, but yeah, I forget. What was your question? I asked you what you were reading. <laughs> oh, that's right. What I'm reading. Yeah. Suspense because, because my head has to be in suspense every day because that is what my books are. I read and I watch a ton of Netflix, any suspense show, any streaming service I'm in it. And it's not even just for inspiration. I just enjoy the genre. Every once in a while I'll have a palate cleanser and I'll read some literary fiction like Lauren Groff or I had some Sally Rooney, Beautiful World, Where Are You? And I'll, I'll, I'll definitely have a nice palate cleanser. Book of the Month is great for that because mm-hmm. I'll pick the one that I'm like, that's probably what, what I wouldn't have gravitated to. Mm-hmm. Like Fiona did, you know, any of those books yep. that will yep. come out, I'm like, that was good for me mm-hmm. to read some really smart literary fiction. But yeah, suspense is, it's just fun and it keeps me interested. And I like the psychological suspense of why did the character act that way? Why did they react that way? I yep. think that's so fascinating. So yes, so I enjoy it. I want to introduce you to Katie Seitz. She writes suspense and she's awesome. She lives nearby here in New York and not in the city, but anyway, I feel like you guys would get along and you are in a similar space and yeah. you're both like mile a minute, like thinkers like this. And I think it would be a fun conversation. So you should do and it we're doing it together or something. Or- yeah. Cause that would be great. Katie site site S I S E. I'm going to cool, put you in touch. So we're doing an event this Sunday with a, a Nashville author. And part of the event is it's a Q and A, but then part of the event as a fundraiser is win a chance to name characters in our upcoming books. Ooh. And I've seen a lot of authors do that, but we're so excited for this because the money is going to go to a, this charity. And I'm, I'm like eager to see the names that are pitched. I keep warning everybody. Like it has to be a reasonable name. It cannot be <laughs> Bodie McBoat face. It can't be like what happened in the UK. Um, you know, you get a vote, but it has to be something that could fit reasonably in a book that yeah. isn't outlandish. So I'm like, I'm excited to see how many people pick their own names Yeah, versus someone who's going to come up with a name, maybe that means something in their family. I don't know. I think it'll, it'll be good. It'll be, it'll be fun. That's awesome. 
Okay, I could talk to you all day. This is like, I'm like having to pull the cord here because we're out of time and I could chat with you all day. I'm so glad our paths have crossed. This is Me so too. fun. Please, let's stay in touch and, you know. Yeah, I know. I feel like I could just hang out with you. Like that wasn't even an interview. It was like I just know, a right? conversation. I, know. I hope we talked enough about your book. Nanny needed everybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. By the way, Nanny needed. Yeah, no. I, I, at this point, I'm like, I, my brain's moved on to the other books. You know, like yeah, I, yeah. I already pitched an idea for the next books inspired by this house. Ooh, yes. And I'm so excited. Like, I can't wait to just. I want to get edits over with these projects because I'm already thinking. You know, I just yeah. my fingers are itching for the next book. So I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank Nina. you. Thank you for coming on. This is so fun. Thank, okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.